Brilliant, thank you. Thank you for staying, and I hope these uh, half a dozen questions or so will help uh, build your understanding further. Okay, first one that came in was talking about the time scale in the Bible, okay. Michael. Yeah. Is, is the Bible time scale real? Referring to perhaps to earth creation, okay. and can it be interpreted differently? Okay, um, I presume that's talking about kind of the age of the earth. Um, obviously, it's much easier when it comes to the New Testament, and you know, we've seen tonight that's rooted in history. Um, but, but what about the time scale of the Bible? Well, as I mentioned last Sunday morning, I think if you were here for the genealogy we looked at from Genesis 5, we're saying that some people look at the genealogies, that's the list of descendants in the Old Testament, and they add up all the ages, and they get, well, one person had a date for creation of 6004 BC, which is very accurate. Um, and... Um, Obviously, um, well, there's two problems with that. Um, firstly, it doesn't fit with what we know of evolutionary biology, if you're going to take that as true. Um, and even if you add in a few generations, and you're still going to struggle to get millions of years, aren't you? Um, but it's worth saying one thing. Um, I wouldn't say the world was created necessarily in 6004 BC. One of the reasons we saw this morning is that the genealogies in the Bible are not necessarily complete. So I think it's a mistake to just add up all the numbers and get to the beginning. Uh, we can see that father can also mean ancestor. The gospel writers felt free to miss out some generations. That's okay. That's the way they wrote it. So I don't think we can date exactly um, the date of creation. Um, obviously, um, uh, people would say, well, there is conflict if you're going to go for a world that's millions of years old and try and trace it back to be 6,000 years old. Um, and there are different Christians that would have different interpretations. Some would say, they would question um, evolution is a, a macro system of explaining everything and they would therefore say that's not necessarily the case. Other Christians will hold to an evolutionary point of view but they will say actually that fits in with the Bible that you know Genesis 1 and 2 aren't necessarily literal scientific you know 24 hour days and, and so on and they would fit it that way. So there's different ways people would look at it um, and I guess probably in a church like this Christians would have different ideas. I think what you can say is that all those Christians would still hold to a very high view of the Bible. They're not disregarding the Bible, they're just grappling to understand it. And I guess one of the difficulties, particularly with Genesis 1 and 2, is that it's quite a unique genre of literature, yeah. unlike, say, the Gospels, which were quite clearly writing about, you know, an historical person. Um, there's a bit more question over those, which is one of the reasons why there's some different ideas about it. Okay, thank you. This next question uh, came in about 10 minutes into your sermon, okay. and then I got another text from the same person 10 minutes later saying, question answered, okay. um, <laughs> which is great. But I'm keeping it in yeah, because okay. it also links into another question yeah. that came in later. The, the original question was this, a colleague of mine feels Christian ch Christians chose what to include in the Bible. Yeah. Are there any manuscripts from those times which have not been chosen, and if so, do they conflict with the Bible. Now, you okay. answered that, didn't you? Yeah. Because you said the, the silence of anything yeah. Yeah. contradictory. Yeah. So, so thanks. But another question came mm. in. What about other Gospels mm -hmm. that were mm. written? Why were they not included in the Bible? Yeah, really good question. So, um, so the Richard Dawkins quote, he mentions Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Judas, Gospel of Mary, things like that. Um, they weren't written by Thomas, Judas, or Mary. They were actually written in about the second century at the earliest. And there are a group of Gospels called the Gnostic Gospels. Now, actually, strictly, you probably shouldn't call them Gospels at all for lots of reasons, partly because they're very, very different. And they're not really lists of events and places. In fact, they don't record many places at all, and they're not historically accurate like we've seen the Gospels you know, tonight. Um, and they're really weird as well. I mean, they're quite fun to read. I've got the collection at home. Uh, the best way to describe how they read is, imagine someone grows up going to Sunday school, you know, learns all the stories about Jesus, and then rejects Christianity, moves away from church, doesn't go to church for 20 years, and then one night, high on drugs, tries to remember what they learned at Sunday school. That's basically what the Gnostic Gospels sound like. There's like little bits of the Bible and sayings that are in the Bible, but then lots of weird stuff with you know, people from outer space and Jesus with the head the size of a planet and that kind of stuff. So they're really weird. They're written much later. They're not written by eyewitnesses. Um, they're not really recording events and places. They're just made up sayings. And so there are lots of good reasons for saying, well, they're just not as reliable. Um, now, why weren't they included in the Bible? What happened is when Constantine claimed to become a Christian, whether you think he did or not is another matter, suddenly Christianity for the first time in the fourth century could start to make official decrees about things. They couldn't do that for 400 years because there was no official Christendom. There was just lots of groups of Christians. 
And one of the things they did is wanted to kind of make some statements about what they believed, you know, Jesus being the Son of God, you know, what books are in the Bible for one of them. Because other people were starting to say, well, should these Gnostic Gospels be in? And so they looked at that, and one of the decisions they made was to say, no, actually, these are the books that are reliable and authentic, and these aren't. But it's not that they made it up. Um, so we've got um, a thing called the Moratorian Fragment from the second century, which is a list of almost all the New Testament books already in a list from the second century, 200 years before, or 150 years before Constantine came to power. So already it was accepted that these were generally in and others were out. I always think it's a bit like, or well, maybe I shouldn't pick the England football team, but you know, people say, like, you know, how do you pick the England football team? Well, do you just start with you know, 28 million males in Britain and you know, start from there or you know, whatever in England? Well, you don't. You know, there are certain players that stand out, don't you, because they're different. They have a quality or lack of it. <laughs> um, but they stand out. And in the same way, there were certain books that just stood out. They were written by people that were close to the events, close to the eyewitnesses or the eyewitnesses themselves. They stood out. And you can do it yourself. You can read the books. There's no cover-up and you can see. So all these stuff, you know, Dawkins, Hitchens, Da Vinci Codes, it's repeated over and over again. It's one of the easiest ones just to say, well, actually, it's, just, it's not the case. Okay. If the Bible can be historically proven, mm -hmm. why do the atheists who study it so much still think it's invalid? Okay. Um, it's a good question. And I really question, do they study it? Um, let me give you an example. Um, Richard Dawkins wrote The God Delusion, 400, 500 pages long, um, which I've read. And in The God Delusion, he spends about four pages talking about Jesus. And he spends about half a page looking at a couple of suggested contradictions, which I don't think are contradictions at all in the Gospels. One of them we covered up this morning. Or we're not covered up, but we uncovered, sorry. <laughs> sorry not, we're not covering things up here. We're uncovering them. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so actually, I think it just they aren't interacting with it. If they were saying, you know, here are some really good reasons for disregarding the Bible, but they're making claims like that that clearly are just not based on what historians know. So I think one of the claims, well, one of the things is, Often they're saying things that aren't based on evidence. You know, look at the sources of what a lot of the stuff in the God Delusion is based on, and a lot of it is Wikipedia and stuff like that. Um, so, so a lot of them aren't looking at this. There are people like Bart Ehrmans, who is a biblical scholar who is, you know, much more read and doesn't believe the Bible is God's words. So he's probably someone that you'd want to grapple with more. And what he's looking at is, you know, there are some differences in the manuscripts. We're not saying that it's 100% perfection here in the way that it's been passed down. But actually, I think he exaggerates the differences. So he talks about, you know, thousands of differences, but, you know, some of those are spelling mistakes and punctuation, things like that. So, you know, it's a bit different from saying, you know, thousands. And the reason why, as Christians, one of the reasons why we don't base any of our doctrine simply on one verse of the Bible is that that means that if one verse wasn't for whatever reason found to be accurate, that whole doctrine wouldn't go up in smoke. You know, we don't believe Jesus is God just because of John chapter 1, verse 1. We believe it because of all of what the Gospels say and the New Testament and everything else. Um, so even if there are minor errors um, in our copies of the Bible, um, I think we can still say, actually, there's really strong reasons for believing the core doctrines of Christianity. And I don't think even Bart Ehrmans can undermine that, although he's trying to. Okay. If the Bible is inspired by God, how did the authors know it was God guiding their thoughts and writings? Now, inspiration isn't yeah, something you've yeah, had time yeah. to major on, but yeah. did they? How um, did they? So, um, it's a whole probably another sermon that we could look <laughs> at in terms of inspired. But basically what we're saying is it's not so much that God dictated, like, you know, the Islamic view of how Muhammad got the Quran, but, but God inspired, he breathed out his words. So, so when Matthew wrote, he kept his personality. When Paul wrote, he wrote in his way and so on. So he inspired them to read. So they wrote what they remembered, what they saw, but they did it with God's help and the Holy Spirit working through them. If you want to know more about that, read um, First and Second Peter, there's some stuff there you can look at. Um, were they aware of it? I think there probably is some kind of awareness, even in the New Testament. So the New Testament talks about the Old Testament as the Scriptures, God's Word. So by the time of the New Testament, people have already accepted that there is this collection of books called the Old Testament, which is God's Word. And, and I think they, in the Old Testament, were very aware often that they were speaking with God's authority. You know, this is what God is saying. And in the New Testament, if you get to the end of, say, Second Peter, Peter talks about people who corrupt things that 
Paul, sorry, Peter says there are people who are corrupting what Paul wrote as they do the other scriptures. So by the time that Peter is writing that in the first century, there's always a rec- already a recognition that what Paul is writing is on a par with scripture. So I think it's not that this is 200 years later, people are now saying, oh, this is God's word. I think already at the time, people saw that what Paul and Peter and people were saying was authoritative in some kind of special way. Okay. Three questions. Okay. Left. Okay. So, let's consider the possibility that the Bible is based on fact. Why do so many people interpret it in so many ways? How do I know who has got it right? Okay. Um, Again, it's another big question that we didn't get to look at. We could probably have a whole other series, couldn't we, on these questions. But um, how do we know people got it right in terms of the interpretation? Well, there are things in the Bible which you know, Christians disagree on. Um, and if you're going to become a Christian, you'll realize fairly soon that there are passages and parts of the Bible that you know, aren't necessarily abundantly clear. But that's not to say the whole Bible is ambiguous and confusing. You know, I think the resurrection of Jesus is quite clear. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, there are matters of first importance, you know, that Jesus died, that he rose again, uh, that this is according to what the Bible said. So what we would say is there are things of first importance which all Christians can very easily agree on. And you can read a Bible yourself without any theological training like Miles has had, and you can come to the same conclusion. You don't need a, a priest or a minister to tell you. And there are you know, other things that are more complicated, and the Bible itself admits that. The same passage in Peter admits that there are bits that are more difficult to understand. But don't let the bits that we don't understand stop us from realizing there are lots of bits that we can very clearly understand. And the stuff that we really need to know, I think, is clear. Who Jesus is, why he came, what it means to follow him. I think we can know those things quite clearly and have confidence in those. And of the other things, well, you can enjoy studying those for the rest of your life too. When seeking guidance and confirmation from God through scripture, the Bible, is it possible for Satan to mislead and misdirect? How can we know a promise made really is of God? Um, I think what we want to do is make sure, so when we're reading, say, the Bible's promises, we want to make sure, you know, who was God speaking to? Um, you know, he promised Mary that she was going to give birth to a child, but I shouldn't take that as a promise um, for myself. It'd be a bit weird if I did. Um, but, uh, but, you know, so there obviously you've got to use your brain, you know, when you come to the Bible, read it. Um, but there are some promises that are what we call kind of blanket promises that God gives to all people. Jesus um, um, gives promises that we can say weren't just specific to one person at one particular time, but for all people. So I think we need to say, well, who was this promise given to? And there are some promises specifically to some people, some that are given to all people. Um, and so I think it's really important. And as we read the Bible, you know, the, ho- the same Holy Spirit who inspired it can also help us to understand it. So that's why Christians, you know, we do it when we preach. You know, we pray before preaching because we want to ask for God's help so that we get it right. Um, and you can do that yourself too. And in fact, you can do that even if you're not a Christian yet. You know, if you're going to read the gospel this week, you know, say, God, if you're there, I don't even know whether you are, and this is your book, and I don't even know whether it is, then please speak to me through it. And he will. Great. Last one. Are we not to believe the Bible by faith rather than try and prove it by reason? Okay. Um, are we not to believe the Bible by faith, not prove it by reason? It all depends what you mean by faith. Um, I think I've told this story here before, but I remember, um, did I mention it last week? I was getting my hair cut, and uh, my hairdresser um, said to me, I really admire your faith. And I said to her, um, great. And then I said, what, what, what do you think faith is? And she said, faith is believing things that aren't true. Other people have a kind of weird view of faith. You know, they say, well, faith is believing things for which there is no evidence. That's often what Richard Dawkins, the new evidence, say. You know, if there's no evidence, that's where we use faith. But actually, faith just means trust. And in lots of ways in life, we have trust with reasons. You know, Richard Dawkins himself was asked by a Christian, you know, do you trust your wife? Do you have faith in her? He says, yes. He said, why? Because there are lots of reasons for trusting her. You know, you don't say to someone... You know, imagine there's some guys like, okay, I've decided to marry this girl. Why? Well, I don't know. She's, um, 
know, I, I don't find myself attracted to her and she's been really untrustworthy and unfaithful and everything else, but I'm going to do it by faith. You just say, well, that's not faith. That's just stupid. You know? Now, there is a, you know, you do trust someone when you enter into marriage or you do trust someone when you make decisions, but you normally have reasons for doing that, for having that position of faith. And yeah, we accept the Bible by faith. We trust it, but that faith has reasons. It's not blind faith. It's, it's faith based on evidence, which gives us conviction. And Jesus never says that faith without reason is commendable. So often people look at you know, the Thomas story and they say, you know, Thomas is commended for believing because he sees. We're commended for believing because we can't see. He doesn't commend us for believing without reason. We don't see Jesus, but we have still lots and lots of reasons. Um, we've got the Gospels primarily. Great. Michael, thank you. Someone did ask me, how do we know what Michael says is true? <laughs> Which I thought was good. <laughs> Check it out is the answer. Yep. Just like you've said in terms of checking out what you've you said. It's something to take away and, and think about, investigate mm -hmm. um, for ourselves. Yeah. If you want to, just a, a little, if you've got more questions about this, obviously you can come and talk to me now. Take a gospel and read it. If you've got questions about the Bible... Um, there's a really good website um, called Be Thinking, bethinking.org. Um, it's run by UCCF, the Christian Unions, um, but anyone can, can go on it and use it. Loads of really good articles and talks you can listen to there by biblical scholars on a range of um, difficulty levels, um, and that will keep you occupied for a few hours. Great. Let's just pray, and then we can go and have a cup of tea and coffee. Father, we thank you for this opportunity this evening. We thank you for the minds that you've given us to think and investigate and ask questions. And we pray, Lord God, that we'd go away from this evening to think further about what we've heard. And Lord, help us too to find ways of investigating further. Lord, uh, as we were reminded with uh, the story about Dave Burke, Lord, maybe some of us just need to pick up a copy of uh, the Bible and read it and let it speak to us. But Lord, we pray that uh, as we go into this uh, week, not only would we um, know you uh, close to us, but Lord, that you would uh, give us uh, uh, opportunity to see you at work in our lives and in the lives of those around us. Lord, that we might see that as we've sung and as we've thought this evening, that you are faithful, you are reliable, and uh, you made us and we are made for your glory. So thank you. Go with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.